So I'd like to um, thank the National Champagne Society for this opportunity to talk. Thank you all for hanging around. Um, thank you to my good friend Kunli for putting the actor Maestro Franco and as the last obstacle to the gala dinner. Uh, I will try to be, uh, if not informative, <coughs> at least amusing. Um, so, um, this is what we call the innovation paradox. It's joined with uh, Xavi Sedeira. Um, I'm from the World Bank. Um, I work with developing countries. How I approach this question is informed by that. Um, I'm looking for common ground. Um, and you'll see many concepts here that I have stolen, that we have stolen from a lot of the literature that people here have developed. Um, also try to keep my feet in my home territory of neoclassical <coughs> economics. Um, so I'm likely to make everybody unhappy. Um, but let's see if something doesn't come out of this. Um, the first thing I have to say is uh, this picture here is by a Spanish-Mexican surrealist named Remedios Varo. It's called The Creation of Birds. Um, and it got to our idea of how uh, firms need to be created, capabilities need to be generated, um, countries need to learn to innovate and to fly. Um, I thought it was really great until Kuhn came up with this flying whale this afternoon, this morning. Um, but uh, I'll stick with it for now and you'll see hopefully that it fits into the, uh, the overall picture. Okay, so what is our paradox here? Uh, start with the man himself. Uh, Jean-Pierre argued that the adoption of existing te technologies accelerates growth and when you do the math, it really dwarfs all development aid. If you just do, if you think that half of growth is TFP and a large chunk of that is innovation and you just take China's 10% growth for the last 10 years and take half of that and say those are idea transfers from north to south, it dwarfs anything the World Bank does. We should just close our, or close our doors and uh, do what you guys are doing. Um, yet, most developing country firms don't do this. They don't innovate, and they don't innovate on basically any level. Um, that's strange. And what is as strange is despite the existence of the Schumpeter Society stressing things like how important innovation is, governments don't seem to be especially preoccupied that their, gov that their firms aren't, uh, aren't uh, innovating, and they don't do much to facilitate the process of catch-up. Um, so this book is about some ideas about why that is and what we can do to, um, to make it work better. So first, the paradox. I'm going to start, hmm, I have this professorial thing, but uh, I guess I can't walk around. I'm tied to my microphone. Um, this figure over here is going to tell you something that you already believe, um, um, that, which is that innovation capabilities are key for developing growth. But I want to give you some... Uh, a, a concrete example, this is some work I did with Felipe Valencia, um, where on the x-axis we have GDP per capita of 1900 of, of numerous countries in Latin America, Sweden, Denmark, and the US. Um, and on the vertical axis we have the number of engineers per 100,000 uh, male workers. Uh, if you just draw a line up where you see Argentina, Chile, Canada, US, Denmark, and Sweden, what immediately strikes you is that in 1900, these countries were all at the same level of income, okay? And in fact, the Finnish will tell you stories about how when they had an earthquake there, the Chileans sent them care packages. Um, that's no longer the case. Uh, we know that there's been a great dispersion in incomes over the last century, and we argue in that paper that this is actually exactly because they lacked at the critical moment of the industrial, second industrial revolution, they lacked the capabilities to evaluate, identify, and adopt the new technologies that were coming online and bring them to their local uh, economies, while countries like Sweden and Denmark, which were off also peripheral natural resource-based economies, were able to do that. Um, and history offers many cases of success and failure um, like this, meaning uh, within the same products, uh, different countries or different, uh, different uh, industries and different locales uh, have very different uh, development impacts uh, depending on their capabilities for identifying and adopting new technologies. Um, favorite one is when the Gabe and Wright brings up with the American South with textiles versus Japan. Um, American South, as you can see here, was relatively under-endowed with engineers at the time and had difficulty basically adopting any technologies from the North. 
Japan, uh, after 1860, 1870, was heavily invest investing in engineers, and had tight links to uh, UK, and they did develop a new textile industry that launched them to the global forefront. Um, the US and Japan versus Chile with copper. I like copper because it's totally homogenous. It hasn't changed much in about 13.5 billion years, just 500 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, you mine copper here, it's the same copper as anywhere else. And yet, uh, Chile, which was the largest world's producer in uh, 1860, was largely out of the business by 1900. Um, and the local, uh, local industry argued that uh, copper was dead as a, as a locomotive of development. That turned out not to be true. Copper still plays a major role, but the problem was the local companies were not able to adopt the new processes in metallurgy and chemistry, and they had to rely on incoming firms from the UK and from the United States to bring them. But the interesting thing is Gaiman Wright will tell you that copper was exactly the foundation for the knowledge economy in the United States. Namely, mining copper led to the establishment of, well, for mining in general, but also copper led to the establishment of the University of California, Berkeley, from which Kona and I both come. Um, the Colorado School of Mines, Colorado, uh, the Columbia School of Mines, all of these were the foundation for a network of scientists and engineers, which laid the foundation for subsequent development. So that when people tell you that natural resources are cursed, you've got to say, hmm, uh, really? And then we find out that Japan was actually a natural resource exporter, uh, its largest export until uh, after World War II was copper. Uh, you may have heard of Sumitomo Bank, that was a copper export company. Um, so the point we wanna make here, and it's not a hard sell in this audience, is that uh, your ability, your capability to identify and adopt new technologies is critical. And it's probably not what you're in that is so critical to your impact on development, but how you do it. Um, and I think this informs what we were talking about this morning with whether GVCs are kind of a magic bullet or whether you have to think actively about how to leverage them for learning. And the same thing maybe with Kuhn's short uh, cycle technologies. I wonder if, Co if Colombia adopted industries or short cycle technologies, whether they would have the same kick as Korea did. And my guess is that if I look at, for instance, the example of Korea and Mexico with electronics, where in 1981 they both started out with similar levels of patents, and yet today there is no Mexican uh, cell phone, my guess is the results would be different. Um, so, okay, um, and Schumpeter is right to breeze through this because I'm already taking up too much oxygen, I can see. Schumpeter was right, the potential gains to technological catch are vast, standard production function, you estimate returns to R&D. Uh, the best estimates I think we've got today are for the US from Bloom et al, 55% in Spain, Dorzelski and Gemadreo, 40%. Those are big, they imply that those countries should be investing twice as much at least as what they're doing. And if you believe Griffith, Redding, and Van Wienen, these returns should increase from the frontier, and indeed they find that as you move from the US to the UK to Italy, those results go from 57% to 70% to 88%. And if you extrapolate out of sample to developing countries, uh, you get to 200, 300%. Uh, this is huge, but if you believe that the further you are from the frontier, the more you can catch up with a given dollar of R&D, then the suggestion is we should basically close down every ministry in these countries and pour it all into R&D. Um, to paraphrase Lucas, how could you think of anything else? Um, and in fact, we do see innovation across sectors in developing countries. This is from a bunch of uh, mining a lot of uh, surveys from around the world. And we find that 60% you know, of countries, uh, of firms in developing countries say they invest in some sort of process or product innovation. Okay, but the numbers are really strange. I mean, the leader in our sample is South Sudan. Um, and uh, it's uh, like two or three times what we find for Israel. Um, there's, we have looked into this a little bit. It has a lot to do with how people respond to what a question is, to what is considered a significant uh, process innovation. Um, we did uh, a, 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 a pilot for Chile and found that of those firms said they were engaging in process innovation, about 10% did something really serious and the rest were like changing light bulbs. Um, so we gotta revisit our data on this. If we take a number which has its own problems in the sense of what it's capturing, uh, but at least we have a common definition of it, um, R&D, we see whether at the firm level or at the country level, increases as you get richer, not decreases, which was not obvious given that the rates of return are allegedly 300%. Um, and in detail, you can see that dotted line is the average for developing countries based on the national level data. We have some extraordinary countries like China, um, which are kind of off the trajectory and 
we could talk about whether that actually makes sense or not, um, but um, we'll come back to that. Licensing of foreign technology is the same thing. This only goes up to about the level of Israel in terms of GDP, but again, poorer countries adopt fewer technologies from abroad uh, than richer countries. That was out of sample. And we'll put managerial, managerial technologies there. Let's call capabilities accumulation the transfer of managerial technology. Uh, it's like any other technology, and we find, uh, and I think this is a, uh, a useful exercise. This comes from the World Management Survey that Nick Bloom at Stanford and John Van Rien at MIT have been putting together over time. These are surveys for each country. We find that, in fact, uh, management practices are best among the worst of rich countries and worst among the poor countries. You say, of course, they're poor. Yeah, but they have so much to gain from actually uh, getting their firms in order and adopting technologies. Why don't they do it? Um, and that's what we're curious about. So why don't they do it? Um, and we argue that the reason is probably the rates of return are not 300%. And that the Minister of Finance, in his heart, knows it's not 300%. And that's why he doesn't close down the Department of Education and uh, Infrastructure. And this is some estimates of the rate of return to R&D using uh, international panel data. Um, and we just allow a flexible estimation technique. And we replicate. The, should we get the Schumpeterian climb as you get away from the frontier moving left? Um, and, uh, but after a while, it turns over. Um, so that's the difference with Griffith von Rienen and all, uh, is that after a while, those rates of return start to fall. In fact, for some African countries, it's arguably negative as you're displacing investments in, investment in uh, areas that are more necessary. Now, what's driving that? We argue it's the absence of complementary factors. The further you get from the frontier, yes, the gains from catch-up increase, but also the probability that you have missing markets or missing capabilities also increases, and at some point it turns over. Um, and uh, you start uh, um, having lower and lower rates of return. This can easily lead to low equilibrium, to low income traps, if you will, or, con or the kind of convergence clubs that Danny Qua has talked about for years, um, where if you are Czechoslovakia, you're next to Germany, you can import a lot of things you don't need really quickly, you can learn really quickly, and you can invest in R&D and converge rapidly to uh, the frontier. But if you are Ethiopia or somewhere in Africa where you're missing basically every market, um, you know, there's just nothing, you, you're going to have to resolve a lot of market failures at once in order to make that R&D a worthwhile activity. Um, so, um, I'm putting this up as what I call the expanded national innovation system. It has elements that have emerged in this literature pioneered by Ben Dalka many years ago and others in this room. Um, but basically, and I call it, I say it has petite neoclassical underpinnings. Why do I say that? Because I have a simple firm in mind. Uh, going on. I don't have an equilibrium I'm talking about. Um, I'm just talking about firms with a possibility for adopting technology from abroad. There's a demand on them from firms to, to accumulate knowledge, which is what we'll call innovation. And there's a supply of knowledge. And then there are a bunch of things that get in the way of them doing what they want. Um, so starting at the right, uh, we have incentives to accumulate. Okay, so this has to do with your macro context, your competitive structure, your trade regime. All the things that Washington Consensus talks about all the time that would pop up the rates of return to actually starting a business and innovating. But on the, low right, on the lower right here, we have firm capabilities. If you do not have firms that can actually do something um, in that context, then nothing will happen. Um, and we have seen this happen. If you look at 1900, so roughly 70% of the firms that were started in, in serious industrial sectors were immigrants. The locals didn't do it. Okay, so somebody was missing some capabilities locally. On the, right hand, on the left hand side, you have your supply of you know, human capital, support to firm capability upgrading, domestic science and technology system, all those sorts of integration with the international innovation system. All that's essential, I don't need to talk about it. In the middle, we have barriers to all these kinds of accumulation, both physical capital, human capital, and knowledge capital accumulation. Now, if we start at the very bottom, we're in Sweden. Okay, what is our problem? We've got appropriability ex externalities, we've got coordination failures, stuff like that. Okay, that's why we have patents, that's why we have subsidies to R&D, that's why we have um, uh, matching grants, that's why we have research institutes, all to, res to resolve that failure. But the point is that if we, in a poor country we see a low rate of R&D, it doesn't necessarily mean it's an appropriability problem. It could just mean that you have barriers to all kinds of accumulation. And that shows up in the fact that they have low capital too, and they have low human capital. So there we have to talk about credit, uh, uh, credit failures, entry and exit barriers, business and regulatory climate, the rule of law. All those things enter into determining um, the accumulation of any knowledge as well as any other factor of production. 
And then you have the government at the top, which is supposed to resolve all of these failures that Ethiopia might be facing simultaneously. Um, so the concept, the implications, and their, their discussions in the literature about how broad the NIS is, I would say for developing countries, it has to be very broad, because you have to worry about all these missing complements and failed markets. Um, this also implies we need to think about how we benchmark innovation. Because if you are, uh, and you can read any number of World Bank reports that will say something like, uh, Chad is investing 0.001% of GDP in R&D, um, and Korea invests 3.5 or 4, therefore Chad should invest more. Okay, that's only true in a simple production function if your other factors of production are available and have been accumulated. And if it's not the case, and the rate of return to R&D is not high, as high as in Korea, and you shouldn't be investing in R&D. So we've got to be careful with this targeting that we frequently see. And it may even apply in the EU when we talk about Portugal should be at 2%. Maybe. I don't know. I have to know the other, the stock of the remaining factors of production. And the last thing is uh, not a hard sell here. Firm capabilities are a critical complementary factor. And we focus on them a lot in the book, drawing both on the work of people here, but also uh, Bloom and Bunrin and the manage World Management Survey. And we introduce some analytics that try to show that not only does management, uh, cap do management capabilities increase, for instance, patenting and other forms of innovation when put in, a, uh, uh, in general, uh, or productivity, um, they affect patenting even after controlling for research and development, so the standard knowledge production function should be aug augmented with managerial capabilities. Management capabilities also increase R&D and they increase the productivity of R&D. So all of this goes to say that Yes, managerial capabilities seem to be critical to the overall innovation agenda, and if we want to be talking about innovative firms in developing countries, we have to start here. Um, I'm going to skip this. Um, I just want to talk briefly about government capabilities and policies, um, because we wind up with what we call the innovation policy dilemma, which is that uh, as you get further from the, uh, the frontier, the number of market failures and uh, missing markets increases, at the same time that government capabilities to re remedy them decreases. Um, and so this can easily lead again to a low-income trap where you need a very competent government, as perhaps Korea was in 1950 or 1960, to manage a lot of these missing markets one way or the other, um, and uh, in order to get a return out of uh, in innovating. Um, and if you don't have that capability, then you're kind of stuck. We introduce um, a couple of good practices to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. We do some what we can consider good practices and principles in the design and implementation of uh, policy. And we introduce something called the capabilities escalator, which is just a way of trying to focus on what your likely group of missing factors is at each stage of development. How am I in time? Okay. Um, so, I'm just going to put these up here. Any of you who work in the developing world, uh, these are somewhat useful. You can say, this is all incredibly obvious. Um, you should have a clear rationale and design for policy. Like, right, OK. I'm going to say, you need to identify something as a market, or you want to call it systemic failure. Doesn't bother me. Um, but you've got to identify some failure that your policy is supposed to address. Uh, you think that's obvious? We interviewed six. Now, eight uh, research institutes in Latin America, oops, and not one of them had a mission statement. They didn't know what failure they were trying to address, and as a result, the incentive system that uh, guided what they did pretty much guaranteed that they didn't interact with the private sector at all, and internal quality was lousy. Um, okay, obvious point, largely ignored. Efficacy of implementation, this is a plea for evaluation, an attempt to implement policies well and evaluate and have a cycle where you um, where we're constantly updating, discarding bad policies, trying out new ones, basically experimenting a bit more. Coherence of policies across the national innovation system. In any developing country, pretty much I walk into, there'll be 10 ministries, and each will have some patenting program or some research program, um, and they all have a dollar and a half in them, so there's no scale and no coordination. Uh, that's not a good way to use our resources. We've got something we're developing called an innovation pub public expenditure review, which is just a way of actually mapping out the, their innovation system, or at least the innovation part that gets money. Um, policy consistency and predictability over time, I would say, uh, maybe this gets back to our discussion about the Confucian folk uh, this morning, but uh, it's 
surprising how many governments will start out the first year of their mandate talking about innovation and the importance of productivity, and by year three, they're onto something completely different. Um, China's not making that mistake. Many developing countries do. Um, so those are simple things, but maybe keep them in your mind next time you're talking with a, gov with a developing country policymaker um, or send them to the book. Um, so just a quick couple quick notes. This is the firm capabilities escalator where we're talking about turning, uh, teaching birds to fly. I don't know how Kuhn's gonna teach his whale to fly, but um, I'll look for the next book. But not to go through it, but basically to say, where are you? Where are your critical systemic and market failures? You know, chances are when I go to Hanoi and I ask them about innovation policy, they point to the nanoelectronics lab, the nanotechnology lab at the University of Hanoi. And that's awesome because they're gonna invent something cool and then there'll be nobody in the economy who's able to take it to market. And as a result, some US multinational will come in and buy it from them, nicely subsidized by the people of Hanoi. Okay, that is not, this is the point we're saying here is, okay, let's take a look at this simple NIS I sketched out, where are your likely problems gonna be? And they're gonna be starting with managerial and organizational capabilities, but also eliminating all those barriers to physical and human knowledge capital accumulation that I was talking about. And then you move up and you're in more advanced countries and finally you go to, to Mars on the third stage. These are not deterministic stages, they're just sort of guidance of the kinds of things you should be thinking about probably uh, at your level of development. Um, I'm gonna skip this except to say that in all these Asian countries, and I believe Korea too, I tried to talk with the Korean Productivity Institute, there's been a long, uh, set, a long investment in uh, various types of management upgrading schemes um, and uh, this is more for my clients, so they see that successful countries have done it. Um, but, um, uh, yes. Uh, and just um, despite the fact that all these Asian miracle countries have invested in these things, I couldn't find any evaluations. That's happening now. Um, JICA is uh, underwriting a lot of those. But this is a, you, you may have all heard, seen this paper already by Bloom et al., um, some characters from the World Bank. And they basically found that if you intervene with kind of Kaizen type programs, uh, in Indian uh, textile firms, you can get 11% productivity increase in one year, uh, and a big increase in the, uh, 30, in the share of good management practices uh, used. Uh, which gets us back, this becomes a microcosm for the overall paradox, which is if I can get 11% productivity increase in one year, that would allow paying off full cost of Accenture Consulting for 250,000, and I could probably get those services for substantially less, why don't people do it anyway? Um, and uh, just to show that we've got evidence from a bunch of other countries that this is the case. Um, but, I, but I kind of converge on the fact that uh, firms don't know what they don't know. Um, we all think we're better than we are, particularly Americans. Um, when you get uh, plot the average manager product, product score from the World Management Survey, uh, and you plot it against the self-ranking score uh, that managers give themselves, you see that the worse you are as a manager, the better you think you are. Um, so, um, the only one, the only exception to this is Singapore, which isn't on here for, uh, for because a, couldn't, it was missing data in other areas that we needed. But, uh, you know, you get to Brazil, and Brazil's really far off, you know? Um, and I guarantee you, this is not, you know, there are methodological issues we can have with this particular graph, but, you know, I've, I presented, I funded some of these surveys in Latin America, and you go and you present them in Brazil, and they say, but Bill, we're a continental economy. We have a huge industrial structure, say, fine. And you go to Chile and say, but we're the neoliberal miracle. Okay, uh, how can we possibly have such bad management? And you go to Argentina and say, we have the best human capital in Latin America. What are you talking about? And all I have to say is, okay, maybe we're wrong on one survey, maybe we're wrong with two surveys, but chances that this, you know, London School of Economics, MIT, Stanford group, have screwed up on all of the Latin American surveys, it's pretty small. Um, so I would say that even at the government level, at the very highest level of the industrial structures of developing countries, there's a lot of denial about how much work there is to actually create uh, capable firms that are really able to do serious R&D and really able to innovate and really drive growth. Um, so I'll leave it here. Um, I know you've seen this quote, but I think it's true. We don't know what's coming with the next uh, round of industrialization, uh, uh, the next round of uh, Industry 4.0 or AI or any of those things, but we do know that if you don't have capable firms, there will be no um, adjusting and uh, taking advantage of that. So thank you very much.